Good morning and welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. My name is Lise Grande. I'm the head of the Institute. We were established by the U.S. Congress in 1984 as a public, nonpartisan, independent institute that focuses on helping to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict abroad. We're honored to welcome 10 exceptional governors from northern Nigeria, all of whom are leaders in shaping their country and the region's future. Please allow us to give a very special welcome to Her Excellency, Ambassador Ogundero. This is a unique opportunity for those of us in the U.S. to learn from and to engage with Nigeria's leadership. A lot is at stake. Northern Nigeria is facing a rise in insecurity. It's linked to banditry, to violent extremism, to poverty, to intercommunal violence. Socioeconomic forces, many that are driven by events outside of Nigeria, are exacerbating this instability. The leaders who are with us today are using innovative strategies that address both the symptoms and the root causes of this instability. Those include economic disenfranchisement, social injustice, and political disenchantment. Our discussion is a wonderful opportunity to learn how this exceptional group of leaders is addressing their security challenges and driving its prosperity. It's a particular privilege to welcome Ambassador Johnny Carson. He is the Institute's senior advisor. He is one of America's most respected experts and committed advocates for strong partnership with Nigeria and Africa. And he, like all of us in the room today, believe that this partnership between the United States and Nigeria has to be based on shared values, mutual benefit, and a commitment to peace and prosperity. Ambassador, please. Thank you. Thank you, Lise, for your welcoming remarks. This is an extraordinary uh, occasion. We have nine governors and one deputy governor from northwestern Nigeria. And uh, I'm going to uh, use this occasion over the next uh, 90 minutes to engage uh, in a dialogue with them about the issues of greatest concern uh, to uh, their states. But before uh, I do that, uh, I'd like to make just a couple of very brief comments. All of us know uh, that Nigeria uh, has Africa's largest population, its largest economy, and its largest democracy. It has a young population, a growing middle class, and a group of very talented and creative entrepreneurs who are driving the country's economy. There is optimism in Nigeria about its future, but there are also challenges. Challenges that all of these governors from the northwestern states of Nigeria face every day. There are challenges of insecurity, of banditry, and kidnapping. And there are challenges that have to be faced with climate change, with issues of job creation for younger Nigerians, and growing the economies to eliminate and end poverty and create uh, opportunities. Uh, this session and the sessions over the next several days will focus on engaging in a dialogue with the governors about the challenges and the opportunities that they face in their states to give us a better understanding of how we can be better partners in dealing with all of the challenges and the opportunities that they face. 
I'm going to uh, start uh, this dialogue by asking five of the governors to join me uh, on the stage uh, here. Uh, the governor of Katsina, uh, the Honorable Diku Umar Rada, who is also the leader of the Northwest Governors Forum. The governor of Zamfara State, the Honorable Duada Lawal, can join me as well. The governor of Niger State, the Honorable Mohammed Umar Bago. The governor of Plateau State, the Honorable Caleb Maftuang. And the governor of Kebi State, the Honorable Nasir Idris. Would you join me and we'll have a discussion. Governors, in, in a couple of minutes, I'd like to ask all of you to share with us some reflections on the challenges that you face in the work you do and the opportunities that you see for your states. And I'll start with Governor Rada, who is the chair of the Northwest Governors Forum. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador Carson, and then the president and my colleagues. Uh, earlier, we took over the administration of our various states, as I mentioned earlier, that all of us are new governors. And uh, we took over with a very huge challenge of insecurity in our locality. And this thing has been happening within the corridors in the Northwest for almost 10 years. And it is a problem or a conflict that is within us that has to do with criminality, banditry, kidnapping, and other sorts of uh, uh, violence. And uh, it's a very huge challenge. Our colleagues, uh, our predecessors have done a lot of things to me to get that, but the issue was not addressed as adequate as possible. And we were so assured that we were informed that uh, our colleagues, uh, our predecessors were here in this institute, well, sometimes in 2016, 2027, 2017, 2016, and also to discuss on this kind of issues. And we are here again discussing on the same issue. Our, the major challenge is our people are really devastated. Our people are really in a very hard economic situation as a result of this criminality that is going on. And the government is facing a lot of challenges. Challenges in terms of economic development and challenges on how to address the insecurity. And it came to us that we cannot be able to address this insecurity without involving the locals. These things are happening within the local communities. When we took over, we set up various security outfits in our localities or in our various of nationals. In the case of Kazana State, we created Kazana Community Watch Corp, in which we picked people from their localities because they know the terrain more, they know the people more, they know those who are involved. They will have to gather a lot of intelligence as a result of recruitment of those young people. And also to block the window for the bandits to recruit more of our youth by providing them with jobs that sh they should take as their own and also take it to protect their own people because they have more what it takes to protect the people because their mothers, their brothers, their sisters are being raped, are being kidnapped, are being killed. When they work together with the conventional security agencies that we have, because the numbers in Nigeria are really very low. So we have to increase the number. We cannot fold our arms as state governors 
because the security is in the hands of the federal government, but state cannot just fold its arm and allow people to be killed on a daily basis. On that note, we were able to set up a security outfit. We equipped them with transportation and what have you. And we are also thinking of how do we block the other end? Because the root cause of this insecurity is as a result of poverty, as we mentioned. It's as a result of injustice, as mentioned previously. People need to have opportunity to survive. As long as you didn't raise the bar of poverty, as long as you didn't provide enough employment opportunity, then there is likelihood once you are, as you are addressing the issue of insecurity in kinetic way, the more they are getting more people to join them. So the states and the subnationals are looking at these two angles because previously, the previous administration in my state has done a peace negotiation with the bandits. But it has collapsed because all the fundamentals that needs to be on ground to make it work is lacking. So what we said is we cannot negotiate with bandit at the point of weakness. We have to negotiate with bandit at the point of strength, that they know that, yes, we have the capacity to deal with the situation, and then anybody who is willing to negotiate, to sit down with us, to arrive at a point, will be able to do that. <clears throat> so we did that. And we are still doing that. So the new approach we are taking now is to see how we can block the recruitment drive by providing, lifting the level of poverty, providing more job opportunity to our teaming youth, engaging them in more productive agricultural business by creating barriers, value chains within the system and making it work. So these are the challenges, and these are the ways we felt that uh, we can be able to address the challenges. And then you have one fundamental thing that is very key to driving the process, building the confidence of the people as leaders. Because in Nigeria in particular, most of the people lost confidence in leadership. So that is why when you make campaign promises, people see it as just a rhetoric mm -hmm. that everybody will come and say those things. But you have to make a difference. How do you make a difference by providing open system, good governance, transparency, accountability on the resources bestowed on you to perform? And those are the things that needs to create and build confidence of the people toward accepting what the government comes with and toward providing are the enabling environment for all our programs and policies to work. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Governor Radu. I'm going to call on uh, Governor Lawal to make uh, a few comments. Well, uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Dauda Lawal, the Governor of Zanfara State. Uh, let me say this. Uh, we came in a very difficult times as governors. Especially for me in Zamfara State, I have inherited a very, very dysfunctional system. I have inherited a serious insecurity challenges for over a decade. I have a state where there is no infrastructure, education is at the bottom, healthcare service delivery almost non existence, and therefore multiple issues. But then, what do we do as leaders? We came with a lot of promises. We came to change the narratives. We came to be leaders for the people, provide certain basic amenities for the people, for them to have a better life. And uh, for us, the opportunities are there, one of which we're here today. We're here in this institute today to learn about Few things. You have the experience. You've been around the world. You know about conflict in different places. What do you do, or what are you doing in order to mitigate some of these issues? So that is why we're here, and I believe there's a lot of takeaway for us to understand 
what we need to do going forward, bearing in mind the kind of issues we're facing, especially insecurity. Insecurity is key to everything. Without security, there will be no meaningful development. You cannot do anything, education, you can't provide it without security. You can't build a better society without security. You can't improve on agriculture without security. The same thing on infrastructure. So these are the advantages. And for us, it's very easy. Bear in mind that we came with very, very good intention, and we want to change the face of leadership. That is an opportunity there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Lawal. Can I also now call on uh, Governor Bagu? Uh, thank you very much. Um, Niger State is the largest state in Nigeria in terms of land mass, spanning over 8.3 million hectares of land. Niger State warehouses the nation's four hydropower stations and also over 92 dams. Niger State is typically agrarian. And when you look at these assets we've got and look at the crisis we face it, you can attribute that a lot to ungoverned spaces. We have borders with Kaduna. We have borders from the north with Zamfara, with Kebi State, and somehow with Katsina State and other northwestern states, Sokoto, Kebi State. So Niger State, um, that is central to Nigeria, has very huge ungoverned land spaces. So uh, in the past, the issue of conservation rather than mitigation has been the focus. The nation's uh, forest reserves are mostly United States. And the activities of loggers, the activities of artisanal miners, because of the endowment you know, of lithium and gold, you know, uh, the, the activities of Chinese, you know, and Russians are kind of root causes to this crisis. Now, as a mitigation, first and foremost, there's need for a concerted effort for education to our people because right now uh, there's scramble between uh, the people to the side of the bad guys and the government trying to woo the people back to this side. You know, uh, so there needs to be a lot of uh, uh, initiatives from the government side and other development partners in trying to engage this teeming population, you know, positively uh, in a way that they'll be distracted to the bad guys. We have, unfortunately, activities of the extremists, you know, organizations of Boko Haram, of uh, the ASWAP, uh, and other miscreants. And these have fused, you know, to become a menace to our peace and stability. So uh, as a government, uh, we're here to learn, uh, looking at all the potentials we've got, looking at all the assets we have, how can we transition out of this crisis? Uh, possible solutions, possible collaboration, uh, possible you know, uh, information you know, from this institute on how we can better solve this issue. And uh, as Diko said, um, we understand the kinetic approach has not anywhere in the world produced result. So there's need for a non-kinetic approach deliberately, you know, in, uh, to, to, to be able to uh, achieve uh, a relative peace within the state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Bago. Can I now call on the Governor of Plateau State? Uh, Caleb Matwang? Thank you. 
Thank you, Ambassador Carson, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's always an honor to be here. I was privileged to be here last year. And um, for me, I think I'll hit the nail on the head. What is happening in Nigeria is a failure of governance, particularly at the national level. I would say the experience, particularly in the last eight years of the previous administration, was a situation where we saw the central government either abdicating responsibility or, in some cases, in concert with the perpetrators of these criminal acts. And so um, it gave such a leeway to these criminals to build capacity that today it has become a great monster, a big elephant in the room, that it would take concerted efforts, sincere efforts, to be able to get this elephant out of the room. What has happened is that typical of a federal system due to negligence or complicity, the fault lines within the nation began to expand. And what we have inherited, even for me particularly on the plateau, I inherited a state bedeviled with deep-rooted suspicion. And therefore, you found, in some instances, you can come to the conclusion that there was a bit of elite conspiracy to be able to perpetuate this criminality as a way of seeking advantage in a competitive polity. What is the opportunity for us? The opportunity for us is to redefine governance, make people to rebuild confidence and trust in government. And it's a shame I had wanted to be on this trip with two respected religious leaders from my state, a Christian leader, the president of EQUA, and the lead, one of the key Islamic leaders, but unfortunately he couldn't get a visa, uh, to demonstrate that we need to build bridges. We need to have an elite consensus that enough is enough, and we need to turn around this situation. I think that my little observation in the last 11 months I've been in government, that the needs of the ordinary people are similar. They want access to good roads. They want access to good education. They want access to good health care. They want to go to their farms and come back home in peace. But as long as this insecurity persists, we cannot obtain anything near that. Last year, before I took over as governor, uh, mayhem was unleashed on my local government where I come from to suggest that there was a political motive. Um, often than not, intelligence has shown that the people who perpetrate these attacks are not within the communities where those attacks came, took place. They were brought in from somewhere, by whom, and for what reason. In December last year, on Christmas Day particularly, the GOC told me the army was dealing with attacks simultaneously in 36 different points. This could not have been farmers had as clash. It's something bigger. It's something much bigger. And I think time has come when we need to be sincere and honest about this discussion. What I think has been lacking over the years is the sincerity to mobilize the political will to deal with this ugly situation. And if this kind of forum can motivate us to mobilize that political will, I don't think the factors are unknown. 
The factors are pretty much clear. We need to muster the political will. And I think that is where the United States government, the United States Institute of Peace, can be able to exert its moral pressure to bring to bear on the political leadership that it is time to rise to the occasion and checkmate this ugly situation. It is not only in the interest of Nigerians, I believe it is in the interest of Africa, and it is also in the interest of the United States of America that its strategic partnership with Nigeria is, is, is brought to the fore. And, uh, the United States cannot take a back seat in giving importance to Nigeria. And I think uh, if this role is well played, perhaps we will see light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Governor, thank you for those remarks. I'm going to ask the Governor of Kebbi State to round out our discussion of the year with the first governors. Governor Idris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me use this opportunity to appreciate you and appreciate this organization that we travel all the way from Nigeria to come to this uh, place. And also to tell you that uh, KB State also is not different between uh, what the other colleagues are saying as far as uh, security uh, uh, situation is concerned. Even though uh, KB States, I sh share border with uh, uh, Zampara, Sokoto, Kaduna and Niger State. Uh, the level of uh, security situation in Kebbi State is not up to the level my colleagues are facing. Because in Kebbi State, we don't have a single camp of uh, bandits. But my problem is because they are my neighbors, and by the time the firepower of the security agencies in those places, they will now run to Kebbi State and seek for shelter. And after the exercise has finished, they will move back to their camps uh, in the neighboring state. But I have the belief with our coming to this place, uh, God willing, uh, when we go back something, we'll go back home with something that will assist us in addressing this issue. All of us has uh, rally around towns and villages during our electioneering campaign, and we have made uh, so many promises that we'll build schools, rehabilitate schools, we'll create jobs, and so on and so forth. But because of the security situation that uh, is in our hand, no meaningful development will take place. So therefore, I feel that with our common uh, something is going to be done to us so that when we go back home, we will be able to address this issue of uh, uh, security challenge in our various uh, states. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, all of you, for those uh, initial set of uh, comments about the concerns that you have about uh, security uh, in your states and in uh, your neighboring uh, states. Uh, before I uh, ask the next five uh, governors to uh, come up and talk, uh, let me just uh, ask uh, each of you uh, very quickly uh, to uh, respond uh, to the question of what it is uh, that uh, you might be able to do together uh, as governors uh, to help improve the security not only in your state but in your neighboring uh, states. Uh, what is it that you do collectively uh, that can be uh, positive in addressing uh, the insecurity uh, and also uh, the 
improvement in people's lives. Uh, Governor Rada, I'll let you start, but I'll let you ask to be quick so that we can get to Th the... Thank you very much, Mr. Carlson. Uh, uh, it's true, but uh, we've, uh, since at the beginning of after our inauguration, we since realized that there are so many things that we don't need to do it at individual capacity, mm -hmm. but we need to do it co collectively. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was what informed forming our forum mm -hmm. of the Northwest Governors. And the first week we were elected, and the first week we were inaugurated, we had our own first meet. And we focus on three key areas. One of it is addressing the insecurity, which has to be collective. Uh, economic development of the region has to be collective because we have so many comparative and competitive advantage within the states in that sub region sub national. Uh, and then we also think that the major thing our people do is agriculture. And we need to improve it so that we can provide enough opportunity for employment, livelihood, and better life. So we came together and we felt uh, we need to address the issue of insecurity. And collectively, we are driving this process uh, uh, of addressing the insecurity challenges. And uh, we have done that already. Some of the states in the Northwest have done that already. We have established, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the community protective uh, community watch. And then we have similar thing in Jigawa. We well, know in Jigawa, in Zamfara, we have similar thing in Sokoto. Kebi is in the five line. Kaduna has done that. So I think collective approach to insecurity will help to address the challenge. Because if I'm able to push the bandit they will move to Zampara State. But if something is being done in Zampara State, they will also push them back. So we can be able to uh, address and eliminate the issue drastically. And the non-kinetic approach also has to be collective. Because if I'm able to fight poverty in Kazina, if Zampara is unable to fight poverty, that means those people that are impoverished in Zampara will move to my state. Because there is no any demarcation that stops movement of citizens from one state to another. So it is really good to address the issue holistically and in a regional approach, and then at the national approach entirely, so that uh, we'll have peaceful and prosperous country. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Rada. Anyone else want to make a comment? Well, uh, yeah. Let me add to what uh, Governor Rat uh, did. Uh, you know, the first thing we realize as leaders is there are problems. And what are these problems? In the Northwest, we realize security is a major fact. And it has to be addressed holistically. That's number one. Number two, we also realize the fact that the entire Northwest is an agrarian economy. And what do we do in order to capitalize on comparative as well as competitive advantage? If we're able to address these issues, that will go a long way in solving some of the major challenges. And of course, there's infrastructure deficit, which also has to be addressed. So the good thing is we're all together. Like somebody said, we're all new governors. And we're here for the people. We're here for the change. We need to make an impact. We need to leave legacy. That is the key. And that is why we're here collectively. Thank you. Let me I, I see that Governor Idris, you look like you want to make a couple of comments. Yes. OK, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, my comment is on this uh, issue of uh, youth restiveness, like uh, Dr. Lowell have said that we have agreed collectively uh, because our state are agrarian state who engage youth mm. to go back to farms. Uh, most of us has provided agricultural input. Uh, like in Kebbi states, uh, my government has purchased over 30,000 uh, solar farms and uh, the 
uh, solar farms and uh, petroleum uh, farms, which uh, the government of Kebbi State, in partnership with the federal government, we agreed to reduce the to give subsidy on the petrol, mm -hmm. so that our farmers and the youth can be able to purchase uh, petrol, uh, and also the government of Kebbi State has uh, shared all this uh, form, over 30,000, free of charge for our team and youth, some in a cluster, some as cooperative, some as individual, so that uh, they will go back to farms. And also government also provide uh, fertilizer. But we can't do it alone. That is why we are here so that we will partner uh, together, so that we will see how best. Because by the time we engage youth, all this issue of security uh, uh, will be addressed. So therefore, uh, I think uh, by the time we have uh, some input from you here, like I said, uh, if there is a problem of security, there is not going to be have any meaningful uh, uh, development in our various state. All of us are one time, time, time uh, governors, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to show leadership by example, and at the same time, to put something on ground mm -hmm. so that we win the confidence of our people. Thank you. Thank you. Let me do this. Let me uh, call this session to a, a, a close and, and invite, if I could, the next uh, round of governors up to uh, talk uh, about uh, their states and the challenges that they face in terms of security uh, and opportunities uh, for dealing with the issues before them. So we're going to take a few questions uh, after this, but I think it's important for all the governors to have an opportunity to present uh, before we get into questions from uh, the audience. So, governors, thank you, and I'm going to ask the next round of governors to come forward. Governors from Jigawa State, the Honorable Malam Umar. Governor of Kano State, Governor Youssef. The Governor of Kaduna State, Governor Sani. The Governor of Benue State, Governor Ali. I'm sorry, Governor. Oh, Please. <laughs> and the uh, Deputy Governor of Selkato, Gover uh, Deputy Governor Gobir. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you all very much for uh, being with us this morning. I'm going to ask you uh, the same question that I ask your colleagues, and that is to share with us in two or three minutes uh, the challenges that uh, you face uh, in uh, each of your uh, states uh, and uh, how you as governors uh, are dealing with them. Uh, on a state basis and how you're dealing with them in relationship to the uh, central government, the federal government, uh, in uh, working with you. Um, and I'm going to start off with the uh, governor of uh, Jigawa State, uh, the Honorable uh, Malam Umar. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, I want to thank the Institute of Peace for this opportunity. I think it's something that uh, is very, very important to us. Uh, well, you see, in Jigawa State, um, not only in Jigawa State, but particularly, let me go up to Jigawa State, the major challenges we consider, since uh, we are privileged for the fact that uh, we have less security challenges in Jigawa State. And uh, that, like I said earlier, that does not mean we should not work together with our colleagues to solve the problem of insecurity in the Northwest. So uh, the major challenges we had, there are two. One is the issue of poverty. And then the other one is youth unemployment. And if you look at these two, 
they are drivers of insecurity, whether you like it or not. So the issue of poverty is a very, very big challenge uh, because uh, the economic activities are very, very low, and the purchasing power of the people is considerably low. So and as such, people can be pushed to do anything. Secondly, use unemployment. By the last estimate, we are almost 7.2 million people in Jigao State. And by the same estimate, about 35% of those are used, uh, which is very huge. So and, uh, if you didn't take care of this use in terms of what they will do, how they will be able to be independent, then it's a very serious challenge that you need to address whether you like it or not. So what are the opportunities? The opportunities is that, like other people said, we are an agrarian state. About 80% of our people are farmers. And we have a lot of land. Uh, we are not as big as Niger State, but I think we have a very vast land, about 22,000 square meter of land. And about 80% of that land is arrival land. Also, in addition, about 400,000 hectares of that land is a Padama land that you can cultivate year in, year out. So this is a very huge opportunity for us. And because of that, we decided to take agriculture as a business. And what we did, what we did was that, OK, since we have realized that, then we decided to form an agricultural policy. That agricultural policy, and we gave it agricultural policies that specified how we can deal with agriculture, how we can do our partnership. And the policy also defi defined the development of the entire value chain, not only production, no, but the entire value chain. So, and that has given us an opportunity. Also, we threat us, OK, where are the crops we have comparative advantage? Then we identify four crops. One, the wheat, the rice, uh, the sesame, and then the hibiscus. That does not mean the other crops are not given attention, no. But we feel that these four crops are quite important, and by the time we continue to develop and improve them, we'll be able to. And I'm happy to say that this policy has started paying for us. Today in Nigeria, we are number one in wheat, and we are number one in sesame, and we are number one in hibiscus. And this has given us an, a, a very good opportunity. And uh, what we did is we tried to develop the entire body. We engaged the youth. The youth now have understood that agri is a business. And they have started to key in through our cluster farming system. We have established a cluster farming system. And that cluster will engage youth. And we give them a parcel of land from government. And then we give them all the input in terms as a loan. And then they will repay at the end of the harvest. Because we want sustainability. If you continue to give them this thing free of charge, sustainability will be a problem. So we feel that, OK, we need to show how we can sustain this system. And then, therefore, the years are being employed. And we are bringing so many policies along the line that we have uh, millionaires, uh, rice millionaires. We have also the wheat. Currently, last week, we were, my, I and my team were in Ethiopia because Ethiopia has achieved self-sufficiency in wheat production. And that has given us an opportunity to see how we can revamp the wheat production. And that has given us an opportunity to see also to see how we can engage in research. Because the issue is we need research so that we can be able to bring in new seeds, we can be able to bring in new technology, we can be able to bring in new system of farming. And that has given us a lot of work. So really, we, we have challenges, but we are able to identify the opportunities that we'll be able to deal with the challenge. So again, uh, from the US, what we are asking is that, we're asking to OK to help us address issues of agriculture. But our system, our land, our topography, and also our soil system is not the same. So the most important thing we need is research, cooperation in terms of research. When we have a cooperation in terms of research, our expert will discuss with our expert. We will be able to show, OK, this is the type of topography we have. This is the type of uh, soil we have. This is the amount of rainfall we have in a season. So at least with your expertise, you will be able to advise us appropriately what to do, what will grow here, what will be benefit here. And I think if that is done, we will be able to make a difference. 
So this is exactly what we have in Jigar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you've outlined some of the the opportunities that are uh, out there, not just the the the, uh, the challenges that are being uh, faced. Uh, let me call on the governor of uh, Kano State, uh, Governor Youssef. And I might add, uh, Nigeria's most populous state. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, um, the advisor. Let me seize this opportunity to once more also thank you immensely on behalf of the good people of Kano State and by extension, Nigeria. Let me see that Kano State, being the most peculiar state in the country, with over 21 million people, and being second most commercial uh, center in Nigeria after Lagos, is also bedeviled with a lot of insecurity challenges. Even though at present, Kano is the most peaceful state. We also a lot, have a lot of um, these challenges. Uh, let me say that when we came on board, we met a very disorganized society. A society that was very built with breakdown of law and order, with unemployment rate at its peak, with also poverty in almost most of the homes. When we came, we sat down and looked at the challenges, and we tried to see how we can sort all those uh, challenges. The first thing we did was we sat down with the security agencies. We listened to their own um, problems. We also tried as much as possible to solve those problems. We established the Joint Task Force Committee, and we as well established uh, community policing within the system. We met a society that was corrupt. Civil servants were corrupt. Stealing was the order of the day. Togri was at its pinnacle. Many of our youths were recruited into Togri, politically being used to maim and kill innocent people. And we felt that we have a duty to protect the lives and properties of our citizens. The first thing we did was to ensure that all those thugs were rehabilitated by the government in collaboration with the security agencies. We rehabilitated about 220 thugs. We trained them and we gave them capital so that they could have something doing and be better members of the society. We also established 21 key empowerment institutes to take care of our team and youths, both men and women. We established a system of empowerment whereby every month we give empowerment to 100 women from 44 local governments. 100 women from each local government times 44. We give them capital of about 50,000 each. And that has been sustained 
I will also continue to do that till the end of our tenure. We also look at the unemployment rate within our youths, and we were able to employ about 10,000 youths into the civil service. We tried as much as possible to send our young men and women to study master's degrees in different countries across the globe. So far, we have about 680 young men and women that are studying in different universities across the globe. We also tried as much as possible to pay for tuition fees of all the state indigents that are studying in different universities across the country, as well as other tertiary institutions. Apart from that, we tried as much as possible to block all levels of corruption. We ensured transparency and accountability in spendings of the government. So with that, we also opened off irrigational facilities for our team in youths. We desilted and rehabilitated the 22 dams we have in the state. And we were able to allocate lands, irrigatable lands, to many youths, including women. We gave them capital. And right now, many of our youths are there engaged, fully engaged in irrigation and other farms across the state. So with that, we feel um, at least that uh, we are reducing the insecurity challenges in the state. And by coming here, like all the other governors have said, we have common problem, that is the insecurity. And we come up together to ensure that through collaborative effort to you, at least we'll reduce it to a significant position. Thank you very much. Governor Yusuf, thank you very much for outlining those measures that you've undertaken in Kano uh, to address both insecurity and to uh, give a catalyst to economic uh, development. Let me uh, now call on the governor of Kaduna State, the Honorable uh, Uba Sani. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kassin. Uh First, I would like to also join my colleagues in appreciating the United States Institute of Peace for this very important invitation to share our experience and to partner with this very institution uh, looking at the way forward towards resolving and addressing our problems back home. Uh, Kaduna State, uh, like uh, my colleagues, uh, we have uh, similar problems with uh, other states, just like my colleague have just, so I want to associate myself with some of the comments they've made. Uh, but uh, Kaduna being the political capital of Northern Nigeria, as you're aware, we are the most cosmopolitan state in Northern Nigeria. Uh, so our problems are different from other states. Uh, we are facing problem of insecurity like other states. That has to do with the uh, banditry, uh, kidnappings, and uh, insurgency. But at the same time, we also are having issues. Uh, that has to do with conflict uh, related to issue of uh, religion and ethnicity. Uh, but of course, I'm happy also to commend the effort of uh, United States Institute of uh, Peace uh, because of the work they've done in Kaduna. And that has actually yielded some result uh, because uh, in the last one year, precisely, we have not actually experienced any uh, religious or ethnic conflict in Kaduna State. That for us is a major development and progress because we believe uh, peace and stability is what we need for development in our own state. Uh, we, when we came in, we have uh, encountered some uh, major challenges uh, in the area of insecurity generally. But uh, as a state, we have uh, 
came up with some uh, initiatives, particularly trying to reach out to those at the grassroots, uh, calling for uh, uh, quarterly meetings that has to do with uh, our local governments, uh, traditional institutions, religious leaders, because we believe we have to come together to work to address the problem of insecurity. And we have also different citizen engagement, and uh, that has also helped us to also expand the level of uh, intelligence gathering and sharing with relevant security agencies that are working in Kaduna State. That has largely helped us in addressing the problem of security in Kaduna State. Uh, one of the examples is uh, the recent uh, kidnappings of uh, 137 children uh, in a Kuriga community in Kaduna State. Uh, you will agree with me that uh, it was a record uh, uh, effort by the entire security operators and agencies in Nigeria that within 16 days were able to bring back the children back home. Uh, and that for me is because of the level of uh, uh, coordination and working closely with the relevant security agencies as well as the communities in Kaduna State. Because we made it clear to everyone that security is something that everybody must be involved in addressing, not only security agencies. We need everyone to be part of it, and that has largely helped us in addressing most of this problem we're facing. Again, uh, I want to also uh, share some of the experiences because uh, as a former member of the National Assembly, who happens to be the former chairman of the Senate Committee on Banking, we came with statistics and data that the northern part of Nigeria, particularly the northwestern part of Nigeria, uh, are the, is, we are facing a lot of economic challenges. And that is what is really affecting the state in terms of insecurity as we're speaking. Today, if you look at the statistics, about 70% of the adult age in the entire northwestern part of Nigeria are financially excluded. That is a fact as of today. And uh, of course, when they are financially excluded, they may not they will benefit from any form of social intervention, either from the federal government or from the state government. So what would we came up with some uh, initiatives. Uh, last four months, we signed an executive order in Kaduna State to bring at least 2.5 million vulnerable, wonderful, poor people within our societies back to financial services sector. As well as, as we're speaking, we have been able to capture about 2.2 million uh, on the SAP, vulnerable and poor back to financial services sector. That is one of the major interventions we've done in Kaduna State. And again, we also look at the level of SMEs, that small businesses as well as smallholder farmers. We have to link them up credit and link them up with the financial sectors within our state and the country generally. Today in Kaduna State, I can say that we have about 14,000 small and medium enterprise that are in existence. And that is the reason why two months ago, we've been able to support them with 4.2 billion uh, grants to enhance their businesses, support them to also uh, expand their businesses and create more jobs and employ more people at the grassroots level so that we can reduce the level of unemployment, address the issue of poverty, for us, is some of the most important things we need to do. Because like I said, the insecurity in the northern part of Nigeria, particularly in North West, is because of poverty, unemployment. Today, as we are speaking, we also are facing the problem of out-of-school children. If you look at the statistics, Nigeria has the highest number of out-of-school children in the whole world. That is statistics as of today. And when you look at the numbers, 70% of out-of-school children are domiciled in the northern part of Nigeria not only the Northwest, but Northern part of Nigeria. And that is the reason why virtually every governor sitting here have really made a lot of effort in addressing the problem of education in our society, because we believe it's the greatest leveler. And that is the reason why we're also investing a lot in education, and we're also putting a lot of emphasis on self-school initiatives. Because when you look at most of the schools in most of these states, uh, uh, state schools that are even located in areas where we have challenge of insecurity. And that has also contributed in 
increasing the level of school children in our own uh, localities and our state generally. So what are we doing? Investing a lot to serve our schools and ensure that those schools that are in security forms to local governments are matched <coughs> with other schools so that no child will stay at home without going to school. So we are trying our best, like other governors have just said, but I have no doubt in my mind in the next few days we will be able to have some tech, 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 uh, some, some of the frameworks, uh, outcomes we are going to take from this very important institution that we will take back home. And I have no doubt in my mind as state governors, uh, just like my colleagues have said, we are new governors and we are determined to work closely with our development partners, including the, this very important institute toward addressing our problems back home. And I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much. Again, Governor Sunny, thank you very, very much again for those uh, points that you've made about how you're addressing some of the challenges in your state. Can I uh, call on now the governor of uh, Benue State? Uh, governor Aliyah. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and I thank the, um, the Peace Institute for this opportunity afforded us. Uh, Benue State is the belt of Nigeria. If Benue experiences peace, uh, it goes without saying that the entire nation would experience the same. Our positioning is very vital uh, before most northern parts of the country got involved in agriculture. They were being fed from the state um, or to most part of the, uh, the south-south state and the southeast. Uh, unfortunately, a number of things you know, have happened. We have quite uh, some chunk of of landmass, uh, 33.955 uh, square kilometers, and all arable. And then of the two rivers we have in the nation, uh, rivers Benue and Niger. Benue, that's, uh, that's the state's name. And then it drones all through the nation into the Atlantic. So 100% we are agrarian. Uh, and unfortunately, the wave of insecurity, it's cut across. Uh, I, sh I think I'll be right to say the entire North, 19 states, even uh, including the Federal Capital Territory at this time. Um, but ours, for some reason, comes in a number of phases. Uh, as I'm speaking here, we have officially identified 17 internally displaced um, people in, in 17 camps. Um, that's the official. Meaning there are some we, we sort of stumble on either at schools or at market squares, uh, and then we copped them into the official rundown as well. What we experience, it's, um, I think a number of states are experiencing the same thing. The banditry, uh, land grabbing, and then the killing. When they come, I was happy to hear one of the governors mention something on the unoccupied spaces. Uh, we have very fertile lands. But because we are doing our farming in the old traditional methods, we haven't gone uh, high-tech mechanized. Um, we cannot cover the entire land, which means we're not doing enough uh, productions on the farm. If we have extended farms, increased yields, then we'd even be thinking of um, processing industrialization. 
Uh, so that will cut a lot of uh, what we're experiencing now. There wouldn't be even any mention of food insecurities. So insecurity uh, of the, uh, the social insecurity, it's now you know, spanning into other areas of insecurities. Uh, part of what is even adding to a nightmare uh, has to do with the many blessings, you know, the land is being blessed with. Nigeria has, uh, in total, 46 varied uh, natural solid minerals. Benue State alone has 34. Uh, instead of enjoying those benefits, uh, we are losing so many people out there at the site and in the fields. Um, we have rogues who come in, and they come in different shades. Uh, the bandits come, they drive away the locals, and then certain so-called investors, you know, on solid minerals, who are not verified in whether they're legitimate enough, you know, to be in the bushes or the sites. The actual locals are driven away. For some reason, are those who come in, those rogues who come in there, gain access, you know, on the sites, and then they are doing their own businesses. So that is one other front that is, conf uh, that, that is um, so much of a nightmare to us. Overall, Benway in the past experienced a lot of relative peace. Um, if we are not doing enough productions, uh, which means most of our youth are just hanging there and they can easily be enlisted uh, into terrible acts. Um, in the next 14 days, we're going to launch a security uh, guard apparatus. It's a local one. Thank God. Nationally, we're all talking about a state policing, individual state policing. I believe that it's going to help us a lot. It's in tune with this kind of a thinking that in two weeks' time we do this launching. Um, it's from the vigilantes and those who feel quite concerned about our own securities, uh, the young people particularly. So it's going to be very beneficial. We know that maybe nationally we have porous borders and interstate porous borders as well. Uh, when those bad people are pounded from one state, they find some shelter in the neighborhood, just the next state. Uh, if we go strong on these uh, internal state policing, it's also going to help us. We need a lot of um, uh, the technical know-how. We've been talking about insecurities all through. But how actually do we train even the young minds you know, to, uh, to help the rest of the people? If we go on to the farmlands, I mean, there has to be some level of security for farmers to do their own farming. And all these will require education again. Uh, we're hoping to go strong again on education, not just being an agrarian state. We're hoping to reinvent our College of Agriculture and then promote it into a University of Agriculture. But it, along the line, it must again come with uh, the tenets of security. So how do we move from where we are to that point where everybody sleeps with two eyes closed? We had some poor leadership. Um, people were not paid their own salaries for quite some time, including civil servants. And if, even the civil servants would not go to work, uh, it increases the fears and the threats of all that. But as we speak, we are um, at par with what our duties prescribe to pay their salaries, including pensions and all that. I think there is a huge shift 
from the bad governance that was experienced in the past with the new crop of governors. We have a very heavy competition. Uh, what it's being done positively in some other state, you know, other persons as well ensure that it's, it's transferred to their own state. And I think that brings a big plus. Um, I feel there would be a number of takeaways from here. One, including that the, the, the technical know-how, the education of what we need to do as the basis of cutting down the insecurities we all fear. Uh, but if we keep just reaching out to the IDPs, sort of handouts, uh, it's not going to solve much of their problems. We need to get them back to their ancestral homes where they will continue to do what they know how to do best, farming, in order to feed the nations. Thank right. you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Governor. We're going to wind up this session with comments from the Deputy Governor of uh, Sokoto, uh, Deputy Governor uh, Jabir, um, and then we're going to uh, take a break after this and come back and continue our conversation uh, as a uh, collective group. But Deputy Governor, you have the floor and the last words. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, <coughs> I'm Idris Kobir, uh, the Deputy Governor of Sokoto State. Uh, Sokoto State is one of the devastating state by banditry activities. Uh, the reason I'm here is just to see how can the institution, the United States Institution for Feast, can assist my state and the entire northern region to see how can we get ourselves out of this problem. Before now, Sokoto State is one of the peaceful states in Nigeria, uh, being a, the chief custodian of uh, Islamic affairs, yet we are able to enjoy feast, living in feast. But now the state, uh, about two thirds of the state were being devastated by the banditry activities. We are in in governing just simply because during the campaign promises, we promise our people that we we'll put all the best we can to make sure we tackle the issue of insecurity. Uh, this is the paramount when it comes to our campaign promises, and that's the reason our people, you know, has confidence in us and brought us in. So I'm here, nothing but peace. I came in with a lot of uh, research and a lot of uh, initiative to talk about. But immediately during our uh, breakfast, General Martin Luther was able to delete my research. It was just uh, somebody who was had a very good research, and you submit for approval, you end up being, say, not approved. <laughs> Uh, so just like he was adjusting me back to square zero. He says something that, you know, it really uh, came to my heart, and I really capture it, and I read him with him uh, about the issue of non kinetic approach. Our governors have put, oh, my governor have put all the best we can to see if we can tackle the issue of insecurity. We spend billions of naira assisting the conventional security operating in Sokoto State by the support of the federal government of Nigeria. At the same time, by making our local initiative, it's just like Katsina State State, uh, a lot had been learned, uh, which I believe our community and Nigeria as well can be also witnessed in order to tackle this issue of mandatory activities. Yet, we know uh, it still exists. Uh, uh, this is the United States uh, Institute for Peace, whereby solving the problem, uh, the crisis, you understand, the conflict without war, without bloodshed. Uh, that is why we're here. And I believe at the end of this, uh, this institution will assist, 
you understand, coming out with a major, a serious major. Uh, why I'm saying so? Because last time, the set of governors are here. Today, another set of governors are here. We are still talking about the insecurity situation affecting the northern state of Nigeria. And I believe this time the institution will take it serious so that the issue of insecurity, you know, will become a history. I don't mind about talking about the agriculture, uh, talking about the economic, IGR, and whatever initiative. Unless maybe it will come, you know, in the process of solving, maybe they are coming as one of the agents of solving this problem which my state or my entire region is facing. But first of all, let's tackle the insecurity situation that is affecting my state and my region. Uh, I believe if for the sake of solving the problem, you understand, the agri initiative will come in, fine and good. The issue of empowerment, youth empowerment, you understand, will come in. Uh, economic, you understand, initiative will come in. It's OK. But first of all, all what I'm here for, you understand, is the majors that will tackle the problem that is expecting my state and my entire region. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me uh, uh, thank all of the uh, governors uh, and deputy governors for their uh, presentations this morning on the challenges that they face and some of the things that they are doing to uh, combat uh, those uh, challenges. I'll end with a, a, a couple of uh, broad comments. And the first, uh, clearly, uh, is that Nigeria is important. Uh, it is an anchor of democracy in West Africa. Nigeria, democracy, can only be uh, sustained uh, if, in fact, uh, people believe that they are beneficiaries of not only political uh, freedoms, but economic growth and opportunity. Though economic growth and opportunity is undercut by insecurity, uh, by banditry, uh, by violence, uh, by kidnapping, uh, by civil strife, uh, by uh, religious intolerance, uh, and uh, by the things uh, that uh, cause uh, conflict. Uh, it is important uh, that as we look at the challenges that are out there, several things are in fact necessary. Certainly, uh, state and federal uh, engagement and cooperation, but also going all the way down to community level engagement and cooperation, where citizens recognize the importance of other citizens in ensuring the safety of their neighbors as well as their families and their communities. So it's uh, at every level that we will be talking over the next couple of days about uh, security, about uh, economic development, because indeed it starts uh, with the need to strengthen that democracy, strengthen that economic uh, development and, and progress, making opportunities more meaningful for people to live in peace uh, and to grow in prosperity. Uh, those are the things that are going to be extraordinarily important uh, in helping to combat the level of, uh, of, of insecurity that's, uh, that's there. Uh, again, I want to thank all the governors. Uh, we're going to take uh, a 10-minute uh, uh, break, uh, and then uh, we're going to, uh, int I'll introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, from uh, the uh, State Department, uh, and then we will have an opportunity to uh, engage uh, in some discussion with uh, that uh, speaker. And then we're going to have a number of case studies uh, of uh, countries uh, and how they have dealt with the issues of uh, insecurity. Uh, there is uh, progress out there countries do and are able to overcome the challenges of insecurity. Uh, and there are methods and ways 
of building uh, resilience uh, and peacefulness uh, in societies. Uh, so we're going to stop right here for this session, uh, and we're going to take, as I say, uh, a 10-minute break. Uh, people can have uh, coffee, uh, find the restrooms which are on this floor, um, and then we'll come back together with our next speaker. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.